Has everyone got their seats already? Um, you should find on your seat, uh, uh, there's some cards. They have QR codes on them. Um, if you uh, do the QR code, you're going to get taken to the podcast, to wherever you listen. And there's also, I believe, a uh, discount code on there for Dynamite Doug merch. So uh, look for that, too. Um, so to get the proceedings underway today, um, I would like to ask our host, uh, Ellen Wong, to come up and make some opening remarks. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Welcome. I'm Ellen Wong. I'm an actor and the host of the Dynamite Doug podcast. It's a story of an art heist, not just of one painting, a Renoir or a Monet, but of an entire nation, Cambodia, the country from which my parents escaped a genocide in the 1970s. This six-part podcast, with the first episode launching today, is based on emails, secret recordings, and over 30 interviews. It's the inside account of how one man, Douglas Latchford, and his American enablers looted war-wracked Cambodia with statues that are still in the Met today. Now, the Cambodian government wants these pieces back. Yesterday, I got a chance to meet with Sopalin Chim Shapiro. She's right here on the panel, and you'll get to hear from her today as well. She's a famed Cambodian traditional dancer who began training as a child in the palace. And she's among the many Cambodians fighting for the return of statues and other precious items that have been looted from Cambodia over the past 50 years. Yesterday, she staged an unsanctioned performance in the Met in order to bring attention to the issue of stolen art in Cambodia. Dynamite Doug is also a story about cultural theft and how Cambodians, like Sopalin, are trying to take back control of their narratives. As an actor working in Hollywood, a struggle over the control of narratives is a fight for which I can truly identify with as well. Now, before we move on with our programming, featuring a fantastic panel uh, who will discuss the thorny issue of art repatriation, I'd like to quickly show a video from yesterday's performance.
It's awfully, so welcome everybody. That was, uh, for those of us who were there yesterday, it was uh, really an emotional dance and done in such an elegant way and such a pity that security guard had to ask you to put your shoes on, you know, I thought. Of <laughs> anyway, hello everybody, I'm Tom Wright. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Project Brazen. Uh, Bradley Hope, who is sitting over there, and I, he's on his phone. We are very happy to, uh, to uh, have you here because this is a really important podcast for our company. The uh, company's a couple of years old. And we've had a few podcasts, but this is a, a really special one. And it, it launched yesterday. Uh, all six parts are out. Um, as Ellen said, it's a story of uh, the heist of a whole nation, you could say, right? The, 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 the cultural patrimony of a, of a whole place. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's not the kind of story you cover every day. It's, it's really something quite extraordinary. Um, who was Douglas Latchford? For those of you who don't, we're live streaming this, by the way, and not everyone is an expert on this subject. So just a quick uh, precy of who Douglas Latchford was. He was a British collector who started in the 1950s in Thailand. And by the 1970s, he, he developed a system where he was really working with the Khmer, uh, Khmer Rouge generals, spiriting uh, antiquities out of uh, Cambodia into Thailand and selling them on the market. And many of them ending up in, in the Met, the British Museum, the Denver Museum, and private collections in America and uh, Britain and elsewhere. Um, so uh, we got involved. There are many of you here who know a lot more about this story than, uh, than we do at Project Brazen. There are academics here. There are journalists. Uh, there's authors who've covered this for, for, for many years as well. But we got interested in it. Um, Timothy McLaughlin, who's here, who's, who's a reporter on the story, the principal reporter, brought this story to us in late 2021. And we, were, we got super interested in it for a couple of reasons. One was, this story was happening now. You know, this isn't like the Elgin marbles or the Benin bronzes that were taken in the 1800s. This stuff was taken up until when Latchford died. He was still, if you look at the emails that we, we worked with for this, Latchford's emails, they're discovering things, getting dirt statues out in, in, in recent years. Uh, the, other is the other thing that really interested us was this wouldn't have worked without the enablers. A curator at the Met called Martin Lerner, um, and an academic called Emma Bunker uh, in Denver. And we were able to, through the, if you listen to the podcast, you'll see we're able to paint a picture of these characters as real people because Latch had recorded his telephone conversations. Um, we also got hold of emails where it's just shocking how they talk about Cambodians, how they talk about what they're doing. And so if you, if you, even if you know the story very well, you feel you do, I think you'll get something from listening to the podcast. Um, we focus very squarely on a, on a statue called the Harihara, which you saw um, softly and dancing in front of in one of the, the images there. And the reason we do that, uh, here it is, here this is a replica of it, which uh, you know, we had a, a local um, sculpt to do here in New York. The reason we focus on that is there is incredibly granular detail about how it was stolen um, and, the, and the way they came up with fake documents. And shockingly to me at least, this is still in the Met, four years after Latcher was indicted. So to discuss these uh, very thorny and interesting issues of uh, what does art mean for the Cambodians, what's the future of Western museums, what should the Met do about this frankly terrible problem, we have a, an amazing panel here. Um, we have uh, at the far end, uh, Sofalin Jim Shapiro, who needs no introduction. She's, a, she's been learning to dance, traditional Cambodian dance, since a child in the palace school in Cambodia. Um, she's the winner of numerous awards including the National Heritage Foundation, uh, which is the, is that right? The, um, the National Heritage from the, uh, um, the Endowment for the Art. Right, which is basically the top award you can get uh, <coughs> for traditional uh, uh, dance. The or National Endowment. Right, yeah. Uh, we have Jason Felch, who is an author uh, of Chasing Aphrodite, which uh, charts what happened in, uh, to the Getty Museum in the 1980s, and he's a blogger also uh, under Chasing Aphrodite, uh, Gary Vikan, former director of the Walters Museum in Baltimore, and also an author of uh, numerous books. Um, and Sopip uh, Chia, who, who is Mia, sorry, who is a um, archeologist. And she's working with the Cambodian government on a, um, a list of all the art that's been stolen from your country, basically, right? And you're based in the US? No, no, in Phnom Penh. Oh, you're based in Phnom Penh? Yes, yes. You just come here regularly? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and on video link, I think we can put him up, is Brad Gordon. Um, he's, in, he's in, there he is. Brad, hi. He's in Phnom Penh. And he's a, an American <coughs> lawyer who's appointed uh, by the uh, culture ministry there in, in Cambodia, also to work on the repatriation of art. Um, 
So I'd like to start with you, please, and ask you, what, what does it feel like as a Cambodian when you see uh, your statues in foreign settings like the, the Metropolitan Museum? You were there yesterday for the dance. Yes. I think for a Cambodian, we, we know that the statue is built for a religious purpose. And it's built for the temple and from, for the people. So the statue is supposed to be at the temple, and then people come to pray. That is a, it's, it's end of the story, it's just like that. And uh, for us now, we, we feel like we believe that the statue is just like us as a Cambodian people. So we are Cambodian, we, born in, uh, we, born, we were born in Cambodia, we have family, we have community, we have our duty to serve our country, and we want to share our prosperity with the world. And we want to be complete, and, the, and we want to remain complete for the rest of our life. Let's see, I think no one of us want to be destroyed, cut the head, the arm, the foot, and then drag away from the home, from, them, from our mom. And then after the remain of our body, we'll send away in a box with a new label, new information. And then by the time that we realize that we are in pieces, we are in the box, like, and then they say, preserve, protect. And we don't, we, we don't want that feeling. We want to be at home. We want to be with our family. And when we see, to the, we, when we see the statue, we feel us. We feel connection. So we don't see the difference between the statue and us. And one more, uh, the other point is the statue have the soul of our ancestor, the soul of our God and also nation. Let, let's see this. In the past, the, the king, or the people and the king especially, he built incredible temple. He chose very good quality of material to make the statue who will serve uh, as a, uh, like those that you play an important role in the society, in our life, like for example, for healthcare, for administration, for um, healthcare administration, also agriculture. So we go to the temple and then we pray for the God uh, to give us the rain for agriculture. But now we do not have the God with us and we don't know what to do. And we cannot disconnect and say, now I do not have God, and then I will stop doing what I have been doing, right? So people still find something and put there and imagine that God is here with us, and then we still do our function, uh, uh, the, the ceremony of worship to the God for our function, but, but right? There, but there's no statue there in the it's temple. Not, the, it's no. The temples are empty. The, the temple is empty. So, and, what, and what you're saying is that part of your everyday life in yes, Cambodia, every, you know, their, everyday their ancestor life. worship, uh, pray for farmers would pray there for, for the weather, all of those kinds of things. Yes. And, and, but, the, but, the, but they are generally empty, the, the, the Cambodian temples. Yes. So I have, uh, you know, when I was studying archaeology, I feel so proud that, oh, wow, my history is like this. But then after several years, and I, I feel like oh, I'm so sad because I know a little bit more. And I want to become a, a conservator because I think I might could help. But then, after some time, I work very closely with inventory and collecting looted data, I feel shocked. I don't know what I'm going to do. I went to different places in the country. I saw only ruined temple. Not only the fragment, uh, not only the decorative element at the temple, but also in the middle of the temple, they remove the floor and then dig the ground to find the um, uh, precious stone or some other jewelry inside that. There's a shocking part of the podcast where Emma Bunker and and Douglas Latchford are on a trip and they they're, they're putting pieces of the temple into a plastic bag and taking <laughs> it back to the to the Raffles Hotel. Yeah, just and, put, yeah. So. Can you talk a little bit, Sofalin, about the role of the statues for, for an elite dancer like yourself? Like, how do you, when you dance, 
what you, like you did yesterday in the Met, what, how important is the statue for you? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have a cold, so I'm trying. <coughs> so, um, dance. The dance used natures, uh, adapted from natures, like the seeds and stems and leaves and flowers and fruits, and we made language to a, a whole sets of movements, to tell story to the gods, and that is our offerings to the statue. And we create the statue because we believe that the spirit of the god possess or dwell in the statue, and that's when the dance, dancer, uh, trained perfectly, would do their offering through the movement to the statue. And they, too, they do that um, for um, land fertility, for um, human fertility, to, for um, removing of obstacles, uh, and so also to show gratitude when their wishes uh, or their, their requests had been granted. And so this is not to say that we are not, we are not believe in learning, we are not believe in great management, we are not believe in good militaries and you know, all of that, or how we, we manage a kingdom, no. But the statue is important to us, it's just, it's, it's connect us spiritually to our ancestors, and that is, I think, it's not superstition, it is, a, a link between the us today and to the past. And this link gives us a sense of, of um, a complete of um, present, past, and future. And that's how the dance had been uh, performing. However, I grew up in a war zone. Uh, I was born in 1967, and at that time, Cambodia was peaceful place, but then soon after that, uh, even when I went to my elementary school, um, there's a bomb dropping somewhere nearby in the school, the students, you know, panic and all of that. So, and then I lived through the Khmer Rouge, I lost my dad and two brothers and grandmother and other family member, uh, of course, livelihood. But one thing I feel that the statue when I grew up, I didn't perform in front of a statue. I went to the National Museum because the School of Fine Art was right behind that. There's the Salara Chana, which is right behind the National Museum. And so as a kid at the time, there was no tourists. And so I ran around the, the play, you know, the, the front and backyard of this museum, went into the museum. Uh, uh, that's how I found my connection but I, I never danced to the sculpture. And also that the time I grew up is under, Cambodia was, was a socialist country. And therefore, to perform for a play ritual, uh, perform for a, a god and things like that was not encouraged. Um, <clears throat> until later on when they, um, when Cambodia had the national, um, elections when, uh, and that's when kind of things bring, open up. Um, I was not in a country at the time. I was here in California. Um, uh, but back to the question to perform, well, I want to ask you, performing how, yesterday. Yeah, how does it feel to perform in a setting like the Met instead yeah. of in a temple? I've been to museums in different parts of the US. And, you know, the, in California, uh, the Norton Simon Museum and others as well, um, the Asian Art Museum. Every time I see a Cambodian sculpture, I feel that, yes, it's been presented nicely. And I can't say, I can't deny that the setting for this sculpture being presented nicely, and I thank you for that. But somehow I felt that why this sculpture end up here? And it should be in Cambodia. And I feel that, I feel that people like Lodgewood um, see the opportunity that we are vulnerable 
And I speak this from a Cambodian citizen person, uh, an artist person. I'm not to to know that that when you are vulnerable and someone is keeping their eyes over and see if you don't look behind you, someone will take things from you. And this is a moment where you want people to see, what can I help you with? Well, that, that's, so, so, so that's where, can I bring in Brad quickly here? Because uh, he's in Phnom Penh, and he's working very closely with the Cambodian government to try to get these statues back from the Met, right, Brad? And um, you have, what is it, 30 to 40 items that you, you believe are Latchford related in the Met, um, but the Met's uh, dragging its heels on returning a lot of those. I know the SDNY is also involved. Can you tell us a little bit about the latest in Cambodia's government to get those statues back? <clears throat> sure, Tom. Look, th there's, there's um, more than 150 or so objects that are labeled as being from Cambodia. We believe they're from Cambodia. And, and these, these objects, these cultural properties are sacred. Um, they're living. I mean, they're, they're, to the Cambodian people, they represent their ancestors. And these, these, um, this, this collection is magnificent. It's incredible. And the Cambodian government has asked repeatedly for the Met to provide all the provenance information on the entire collection. Because you know, it's not just 30, it's, it's many more that the Cambodians want back. And we, at, you know, at the moment, um, you know, priority, of course, you know, anything linked to Latchford, to Sphinx, to Weiner, and so on, you know, the Met shouldn't be delaying anymore. Tomorrow morning, the Board of Trustees of the Metropolitan Museum, the most prominent museum in the world, should wake up and say, this is all wrong. We have unclean hands here. We have, we know, we know that this is all stolen. And we should say to the Cambodians, anything you want, you can get back. You know, it shouldn't be that they're just gonna give back one or two. Um, I would say that we're accelerating our call for the Met to return Cambodian statues. Um, a number of the statues have come down in recent weeks. We wanna know why, where, you know, where did they go? And the Harihara in particular um, is one of, of incredible interest to us because we have documents. We have a letter from 1974, um, an internal letter from, from um, Sphinx that makes it clear that this Harihara came out of Cambodia in, in 1974 from, from the south of the country. And in that letter, it talks about Latchford. It talks about how they're going to you know, create fraudulent documents, how they're gonna traffic this stolen statue um, out of Cambodia and abroad. And it's clear to us, and, and this was actually mentioned in the indictment against Douglas Latchford in, um, in, in um, 2019. And it's, it's clear, it's so clear to us, this is stolen. The Harihara is an exceptional Sculpture, it's something that's it's 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 very meaningful to the Cambodians. We want it back. Give it back to us tomorrow. That's that's don't, fascinating. Don't so just for everyone here in the room, the, this is the Harihara here. Um, and, and it's an eighth century pre Angkor uh, statue. And as 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 he was saying, there's documents we know that they tried to cover up uh, the fact that it, they didn't have an export license for it. They talk about trying to create a provenance for it. Um, Gary, I'd like to bring you in because sure. you obviously have experience being a director of a museum for many years. Um, you sort of wrote a confessional, Sacred and the Stolen, about, about some of the things you have, to, the, the, the packs you have to make with the devil when you're a museum director. Can you try to get us inside the head of, of whoever at the Met is making these decisions about something like the Harihara? Why, when Latchard was indicted in 2019 and they mentioned this statue and they say, look, this, we, we've got to make up documents for this in the 70s. Why, uh, why do museums sometimes seem so reactive um, with these well, issues? Well, they are reactive, I think, because the boundary between what's going on now and what could happen next is not clear. And so you enter Gallery 249, and the things that are Latchford or Latchford-related are maybe 
what, 40 right. items. And there's another 67 items, or whatever the number is, Bradley, uh, and some of them go back to the 1920s. And so the Met wonders where their end is, and I can empathize with that. Meaning how far back do you go? Yeah, how far back do you go? And I, the case you make is very powerful. And just rolling the tape back, I'm not responding specifically to a question you ask, but when you make a decision to acquire something, and let's put ourselves back in 1983, and that spectacular statue is now being offered to the Met at probably a fairly large price. I don't know what it was, upper... Uh, this statue was, uh, in 1977, was offered for $300,000, which is $1.8 million today. Yeah. So, extremely so it's a significant purchase, right? And so the director is there, the curator is there, and you know their names. And what was flawed at that moment and what somebody should have said was the obvious point that you make with passion and clarity is these objects were attached to something. These objects have spiritual import. These objects come from a war zone. These are three red flags, which no matter how you play the game in the 1980s, puts them at the far end, and perhaps beyond the, I think beyond the far end, of what is acceptable. Even, even in the standards of the times. I think it's way out of bounds at the time, yeah. And so if the curator says, as he said, well, uh, I didn't follow the good advice of the director to contact the country of origin because there was no government to contact. Right. There's two ways of looking at that. One, there is no government to contact, but the very fact there is no government to contact means you shouldn't be touching this. Right, you're referring to Martin Lerner, one of yes. the, one of the uh, when he, back in the day, the curator who acquired this statue in 1977 told the New York Times later, um, not actually about this statue, but about another statue, right. there was no government to contact at the time, and that was during the Khmer Rouge uh, and so genocide, when you, right? When you so why should you be read all this from stuff and it says, well, the problem with Bunker and Latchford and, and Wiener is they're playing by the rules of the 1980s in the 2010s, right? They're not. They were out of bounds in the 1980s. Fascinating. And somebody should have called them on that. This was, this was really beyond um, what was then even normal. Well, Jason, you've written a lot about the 1980s, and he, he's written a wonderful book about, about the Getty Museum and, and, and the corruption there in the 80s, right? Yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> what, what, I want to ask you, why is there so much bad behavior in museums? Aren't these supposed to be the, the temples of, <laughs> the temples of, uh, of, of, you know, Yes, of Western academia? culture, yeah. Um, the, the, the problem with Gary's um, setup, and, and Gary and I have um, talked about these issues before, um, is that f from, I, I agree that it should have been outrageous in the 80s to acquire that object, but every museum in this country was acquiring objects like that in the 80s, forgive me, including Gary's museum. <laughs> You'll have to in the 90s, in this case. <laughs> in, in the 2000s, and today, those type of objects continue to be acquired. And so, it's fine to say, well, it should have been different, but it wasn't different, and it's not different now, and these type of objects are continuing to be acquired. Today, we're talking about Southeast Asian objects. Um, a decade ago, we were talking about Mediterranean objects from Greek and Rome, and we were unraveling the trafficking networks, the Latchfords of um, Italy and Turkey well, and Greece. Let's talk about the golden, sorry, sorry, Gary, one second. Let's just talk about the golden coffin. So the, so the golden yeah. coffin uh, was taken from Egypt, stolen from Egypt, and the Met had to give it back only 2019, right? That is correct. Right, so in 2017, the Met acquired a huge, beautiful golden sarcophagus that had never been seen before. That is the biggest red flag there is. Where has this thing been? Uh, they were told a story. They, didn't, they contacted the Egyptian government to see if the story was accurate. The Egyptian government did not give them the documents they wanted, and so they proceeded without them. And uh, soon it was uncovered that that uh, golden sarcophagus had been stolen from Egypt, trafficked through a very prominent trafficking network through Europe, and was one of hundreds of objects passed through this network, and that are still to this day being unwound. So this is an ongoing problem. This is not a historical problem. This is a problem with museum culture today. And um, 
despite writing a book about this in 2011 that I thought would help change the culture, and despite a wave of reforms year after year, this is an ongoing problem. So I, I just think that the Met's reluctance to give up the Harihara and to give up the dozens of other Latchford objects that are obviously stolen during a genocide by the Khmer Rouge with the cooperation of Emma Bunker and Douglas Latchford and perhaps the Met Curator, um, they're going to try to hold on to this stuff as long as they can because existentially that is what museums do. The, I, I remember John Walsh, the former director of the Getty Museum, once said, uh, an art history student asked him, what, you know, what makes for a great curator? Is it knowledge of art history? Is it an aesthetic sense? And he said, no, it's none of those things. It's curatorial avarice. Oh, yes. Curatorial avarice. Museums, American museums, have a culture of acquisition. That is their mission. And they are here to acquire other people's culture. And so to ask them to give it back is anathema to what these museums have done for centuries. Because they'll end up becoming empty. No, I don't think they will end up becoming empty. I'll tell you why. I was at the Natural History Museum of Utah last week. <coughs> they have a visiting um, exhibit on loan from the Cambodian government. It's all about Angkor and the culture of Angkor Wat. Um, it is incredible and uh, huge. And all, as part of that traveling exhibit, again, on loan from the Cambodian government, are, is uh, an object that the Met gave back to Cambodia in 2013 uh, or 14, the kneeling attendant, one of the two kneeling attendants that used to frame the gallery that you were in yesterday. There used to be two kneeling attendants from Prasat Chen, the temple of Koker, where the Duryodhana and some of these other objects came from. That is now on loan to a museum in the United States, totally legally, and with the participation and interpretation of the Cambodian So, so just, to, just to sum up for everyone, a statue stolen by Latchford, yeah. donated, donated to Martin Lerner at the Met, yeah. returned in 2013 by, by Maxwell Hearn to Cambodia, and now back on loan to... Do you, Sophie, do you think this is, this is a potential way forward, that, that you could have a licensing system? So all of this art that you're cataloging could go back to Cambodia, be, to go back to the National Museum, uh, Brad as well, and then th this could be then licensed back out to foreign museums. Do you think that's a way forward for the way that museums should work? I think uh, the Ministry of Culture and Fine Art, the minister, also thinking about this. For us to have ownership of what we have, that is important. Of course, some other statues are important for the community, for the people, so we have need them to, to be back home. And in case that the shit, uh, statue was stolen and then there are so much drama that happened during that time, in some way that we could not let it be there, you know, like it's too cruel. Like, as, as I heard from the, the former looter, I feel I frozen, I was frozen because I heard what he dragged the statue, he cut, and then he put in the water quite some time, and then he moved back. So those kind of activities was so, too cruel to, to uh, accept. So sometime I think maybe in uh, some statue could not be there. Right. You have to be back home. Gary. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, Bradley. Um, sorry, I, I, I was just going to say that you know, the, the Cambodian government doesn't want to empty every sure. museum of everything that's there that's Cambodian. You know, there, the, the, there are certain priorities. There's, there's ones that just want to come home. But I think you can't lose sight of the fact that these are spiritual objects. These are living, you know, living beings. And so, you know, a licensing system, you know, I don't know, you know, they're open to, um, in some cases, having these statues be ambassadors for Cambodia and having them on loan maybe for three years, five years. But it's something that the Cambodians really want to have power over to decide. They want to clear that these are owned by Cambodia. And if they want something to come home, it needs to come home. But there are cases where they're going to say, well, you know, maybe we're OK with having it there. It's, but it's got to be respected. It's got to be taken care of. If, if Cambodians want to go and dance in front of it, want to um, put flowers in front of it, want to pray to it, uh, pay respect, they can do that. They don't want, 
it to be contained in a glass case and they can't do all those things. And that was that was um, the point of the of the dance yesterday, right? To be able to yes. perform in front of it as you should do. Yeah, and I think that we are talking about the sculpture and Sapir is mentioning about the broken of the sculpture. And I think that it's applied to other things about Cambodia as well. Our sense of culture and, and identities, um, our land. Um, so I think that we, we use, we focus on the sculpture, the ownerships and how we could share it um, specifically on this particular uh, of, of the sculpture. But there's other thing. From what I see is that like, trafficking, there's, there's many trafficking, human trafficking and other trafficking. And so in this case that sculpture is trafficking is, is have to stop. Cambodian need to heal, need to change our image and our future, which means that, let's say we focus on the sculpture in this case, bring the sculpture back, make Cambodia the whole country as a museum, where the sculpture can exist in all their temple and where they're supposed to be, and the people worship them when they want to, and nobody loot it, nobody loots. And this is the peace for the sculpture, the peace for Cambodian people, and it's also a piece where you can come and share with us. Yeah, I mean, Angkor Wat is, uh, is uh, one of the world's mo foremost uh, tourist sites, but it doesn't have those statues. Um, Gary, I want to ask you, why do museum curators who do illegal things <coughs> not get indicted more often? It's a good question, because it's a white-collar business. Right. And it's a very loose and familiar business. And I think within the context of your podcast, where one of the players said it was the willing, I think it was Wiener, uh, conspiracy collaboration of, of those conspiracy of the willing, yeah. The conspiracy of the willing, and in those days, uh, these were sins of omission, which did not make them not sins, but they were omissions. What you didn't say, what you didn't know, was privileged. Well, right. So we go back to your point earlier. This statue's taken out in the seventies. There were red flags because it, there was a genocide going on. Yes, if you thought right. it, but if you don't ask, right, and if you don't think, and perhaps and, if you don't read the newspaper, and legalistically. <laughs> Um, you could you could make the point. Well, there's actually no uh, patrimony law in Cambodia at the time, or there's yeah. no government. Uh, but I don't think anybody got down to that level because nobody expected that issue to come up. In fact, I didn't hear about patrimony laws until I'd been a director for nine years. I didn't even know that this was part of the deal. Wasn't part of the discussion. No. Never. That's amazing. Yeah. So. Um, Getting back to this issue that Bradley raised, namely who gets to decide, mm. and the issue of title. So there are two million objects in the Met. They show 80,000 pieces. We're talking now about 40, perhaps 70, perhaps 110. The museum's not going to be empty. Walking toward, as I did yesterday, Gallery 249, right near the information kiosk in the front of the Met, it is a spectacular Mayan stela. And as I walked up toward that, I said, I'm going to read the label because I think I know who sold that. And I fully expected it to be under that umbrella of ambiguity of yesteryear. In fact, it's on loan from Guatemala. <laughs> and I think that's exactly where this situation <coughs> needs to end up. I mean, I firmly believe in encyclopedic museums. I think they have huge value. I wouldn't like to think that every Cambodian sculpture is in Cambodia. They need to be ambassadors. I hope they will be ambassadors. But Cambodia well, the, well, needs to pick their own ambassador. The kneeling attendant is currently in Utah, right? Right. Yeah, so, that, so that's yeah. a model. No, that's, that's a very good model. Mm. And I think, but getting back to this business of curators who are good curators and directors who are good directors of good curators, being acquisitive, and competitive. That's a chemistry. And that chemistry, I think, helps to explain Latchford's seeming irreconcilable behavior. How on one hand, he can give pieces back while he's exactly at that moment transacting to sell looted pieces. 
that yeah. he can be celebrated well, in Phnom Penh and be cheating them at the same time. Yeah. Right. What goes on in this guy's head? So he's talking about how Lashford would, would, would donate pieces back to the National Museum and at the same time be stealing things. And who wrote the preface to the 2003 book with all the looted stuff in it? Well, if you're a cynic, you might say well, Latchford was donating lesser pieces back to the Cambodian Museum to cover the fact Well, he, he was. was. There's no question about that. But what really caught me in the sixth episode of the podcast was the conversation Bradley had with Emma Bunker. Was it three days before she died? Something like that. And she so, said... Sorry, can I, let me just break in very quickly. Yeah. So in the podcast, Bradley's trying to help the Cambodian government yes. get art back and Emma Bunker's about to die, right. and she's feeling guilty about the role and she's played. And six months with. before she died, her boyfriend, Latchford, died, right? So it's the end game. And she says to him, why do you think I published this book in 2003? That book was on fire. That was a guide to their crime. So you can say, well, that's a way of cleansing and laundering and making everything kosher. But on the other hand, it was a map to all their deceit. And I think that avarice, that craziness, that, that kind of DNA that you describe will allow for that seemingly... Humans, are, humans are complicated beings. Absolutely. You know, but, but also they used the book as a catalog to sell things. You know, when, when yeah. they sold to Jim Clark, the, the founder of Netscape, and Jim Clark had, this is in the podcast, he had some concerns about, oh, asking Latchford, oh, we, oh am I going to have to give this up? Is it stolen? And he said, no, no, no. It's all in the book, Adoration and Glory. Right. <laughs> and that was, that was a way, and that was the role that Emma Bunker played as an academic. She cleansed she did. Uh, the purge. But, but from their point of view, and as she told Bradley in the, in the podcast, I don't think Bradley's heard the podcast yet, but she, 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 she told him, um, no, this, this whole book was written as a catalog of saving, but that's where you get to the, you know, the white man savior complex, right? We're gonna save Cambodian culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Tess Davis is in the room, and uh, there she is. And you make the point in the podcast that it actually exacerbated, no one was saving Cambodian culture from the Khmer Rouge, it was exacerbating do you, should we just give you a microphone quickly so you can make that point, <laughs> rather than have me make it for you? Yes, no, I mean, this material survived for a millennia in some cases, completely intact through numerous conflicts. Um, and it wasn't until there was a demand, and that demand was largely coming then, as it is today, from the United States. Um, and of course, museums set the standards for the market. You're not going to see better ethical standards at an auction house, a gallery, or an independent dealer than you see at the Met Museum. That's not going to happen. And so for that behavior to have gone by and survived for so long, um, as Jason mentioned, we're still dealing with the consequences of that today. These objects are still being acquired today. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's not ancient history, right? Um, we, we should be fair to museums to note that <clears throat> there is a generational uh, transformation happening with museums slowly, but, 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 um, but certainly. And a, a way a number of museums have begun to address this issue is by separating the role of the curator, whose job it is to acquire, from the, re, the curator of provenance, whose job it is to actually do the investigation of these objects before they're acquired and ask all those sharp questions that you need to be asking. Are these documents fake? Um, it, was this looted during a genocide? Um, and, and within the museum, have someone whose job that is. The Met does not have that position. That's almost like um, having a compliance person in a bank. Yeah, and that's then exactly it, right. And the reason you legal have, and have no someone power. else do that is because the guy whose job it is to make a deal doesn't want to do the compliance. So you need someone else whose job it is to put the brakes on. Yeah, you're absolutely right, except the oddity is when they were dealing with Latchford and company, there was no investigation to do. It was on its face, looted stuff. <laughs> it was just obvious. Yeah. Right. And they didn't come from nowhere. It hasn't been kicking around in Paris for the last 72 years. Yeah, so, so you know, um, is Erin Murphy, uh, sorry, Erin Thompson here? Aaron She's Thompson? just to your left. No, oh, there you are. I wanted to bring you in quickly because you, you, um, you, yeah, you don't know I'm going to do this, but you, you posted on Twitter two weeks ago about how, how the Met had taken down a statue, um, and it was a statue that you'd been following, and the, because the feet were in situ, 
So there are, I just want to bring this in because there are cases, and you brought that up earlier about feet being in situations where it's very obviously looted, right? Because mm -hmm. someone's cut off the thing. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you follow that statue um, and, and then what's, what do you think is happening at the Met? Because we should say they are taking statues down now, right? It's happening in real time now, all linked to Latchford or, or this one is linked to Wiener, Doris Wiener, I think. Uh, well, last summer I emailed Brad and invited myself to Cambodia, and he said, "Fine, <laughs> I'll take you around." Uh, so we went to Coquer, and he's like, "Look, there's some feet, uh, and that the the statue to whom those feet belong is in the Met." Uh, so I cannot believe that. I still can't really believe that. Uh, it, it is uh, very definitely true. They also um, talked to the the man who dug it up, who looted it and uh, have proven it in a complete variety of ways, up, down, left, center, so donated by a committed smuggler, and yet it was still at the Met. And so, uh, because I go to the Met often, the last time I was there, I noticed, oh, uh, this statue is no longer on display. I took a little selfie of myself in front of the sticky parts on the wall where they had ripped off the label <laughs> and tweeted that. Uh, and then the Times ended up asking the Met about it, and the Met spokespeople said, well, we've taken off display for further study. And I'm still like, further study of what? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want it to come alive and tell you that it's from Cambodia? It's, it's very obvious to me. No, I mean, it's shocking. I mean, the, the indictment of Latchford was already four years ago. Um, and, and so the fact that they came out with that statement to the New York Times saying, so we have, they always refer to dealers or something generic, but they're talking about Latchford, right? And they're saying suddenly something happened. And I, it's, it's unclear what that could possibly be. Well, it's, I think it is clear. It's clear that they're getting public attention. Uh, or, or the Southern District of New York has started asking them to take them down. Ooh, I hope so. But it's true. I mean, last year, a similar thing happened. I went to Nepal and saw the bottom half of a wooden sculpture, the top half of which was in the Met. And I contacted the Met and said, look, I took all these measurements. Maybe you'd like to think about this. And they said, oh, no, we've known about this potential match for like four years. I'm like, my two-year-old could do that. It's a two-piece puzzle. Uh, get your act together. And then suddenly, um, after I wrote an article about this, they gave it back to Nepal within a couple of months. So I think this type of public attention, this type of scrutiny, just this type of people saying, where did that come from, yeah. is what's needed to make change. By the way, you have, she has the best job title of anyone I've ever heard. She's a pr professor of art crime. Is that right? It's a cool, cool job. We, we Tom, shouldn't, can we I sh just jump we shouldn't in omit. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go just ahead. let him come in. Uh, sorry, I just, I mean, I wanted to say just one thing. You know, we talked about the way the Met behaved in the past. But, you know, what is so troubling to me is the deception that they continue to follow practice today. I mean, they're, they're telling the press they're in close dialogue with the Cambodian government. That's a lie. They're not in close dialogue. They are. They've been silent for a lot for some time now, and they've been hostile to us when we request provenance information. They're not in close dialogue. Hmm. Um, they're going to come out on the wrong side of history on this for sure. And I think what has to happen is that museum needs to change. It needs to be a leader in terms of ethics, in terms of how they deal with with investigations and requests and so on. It's it's unbelievable to me that a leader in the field like this would be behaving so unethically and so questionably in terms of you know what they've been doing. So I want them to wake up tomorrow morning and just say, "Look, Cambodia, come tell us what you want. We'll give it back. Let's discuss you know possibility of loans for certain objects, um, but we're not going to play these games anymore. We're not going to lie about things." We're not going to cover up the fact that we, we don't have provenance. Um, we're going to acknowledge that these are stolen antiquities, and we shouldn't have them. Is, is anyone here from the Washington Post or the ICIJ? Oh, hi, at the back there. Yeah, well, you obviously you did a, a fantastic piece about, about um, all of this back in, um, I think, October of 2021, including mentioning the Harihara, right? Um, yes. Yeah, and so, right. we, so we actually... Uh, got interested in the Harry Harrow because of your reporting. So, you know, r reporters getting on other reporters' shoulders and all of that. Um, or, yeah, whatever, however you want to <laughs> phrase that. <laughs> um, but but um, one thing we noticed using the Wayback Machine, uh, where you can see how people change the uh, internet, is that after your reporting, the Met changed the description <laughs> of this from in Cambodia to in Cambodia slash Vietnam. 
And that's, that's the same uh, list that they gave to, uh, to Brad. So it's pretty interesting, right? Because um, I, you could take a charitable view of that and say they got some new research and it may have been from Vietnam, or you could say they were trying to muddy the waters a little bit and... Uh, yeah, you know. and, and it's been interesting because, you know, I, I don't know the technical ins and outs of this, but the using the Internet Archive Wayback Machine to kind of look at a lot of the Met's old uh, internet presence, it, it, it apparently the Mets API has not really let the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, crawl it as as well as we'd like it to. So it's it's really the it's it's kind of like the uh, the exception when we are able to find their old um, their old provenances and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean we've seen it, we've seen in in a few different cases we see the Met change its its explanation or its description. Um, of uh, Cambodian or other Southeast Asian uh, sculptures uh, w without any explanation, and they haven't uh, they haven't responded to our questions about those. So fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to very quickly just uh, shout out to Timothy McLaughlin and Evan Moffitt, who are reporters on the story. Um, where are they sitting? Yeah, Fant fantastic work. Um, they got people to talk. If you, if you listen to the yeah. And, and sitting, sitting next to them is Joanne Levine, who's the story editor, and uh, the, the audiation team should be here, Matthew and Sandy. So congrat <laughs> there they are. congratulations to all. Um, so, so Tim uh, got, a, a re well, they all got great gets in the reporting, um, but one of the things was we got Alex Gertz, who's a, um, a dealer who says the most extraordinary things in the podcast. He, <laughs> he says things like, <laughs> uh, he, he basically says, oh, Nancy Weiner got indicted because she gave a fake pro for provenance for a statue, and I told her, I told Douglas, yeah, he should give her the fake provenance, right? So, <laughs> we, and he does it in a way, he does it in a way that, like, this is just part of the course, and he's talking about that today. This is a guy in his mid-70s now. Um, so, yeah, very good reporting. We got, we got uh, Lois Lamennell to talk loads of interesting people. But he laments that he was born too late. Yes. <laughs> to be there at the good time. Everybody was born too late to be <laughs> yeah. there at the good time. I, I wanted to point out the elephant in the room because it's, a, it's an important part of the equation that, and, and that your central question is why is the Met not giving these things back? And, and an important part of that is because people not on stage and that we haven't talked to yet um, are, but who are in this room include um, prosecutors with the Southern District of New York uh, and uh, federal agents with Homeland Security investigations. Those are the people who since 2012 have been pursuing the return of these objects on behalf of Cambodia and the assets that Latchford illegally acquired in the sale of all these objects. And their investigation has been the one that is really driving this case uh, and, and to a certain extent has stepped in between Brad and the Met and is, and is you know, in the midst of this conversation. And it's their work that has really forced this case, and there are hundreds of cases like this, to the to the you know front page of the newspapers and to your podcast and to yeah. all of our attention, um, and and that work is extraordinary and does not always happen. Yeah, this is this is yeah, and it's a live investigation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the Met the Met might want to blow off Brad forever, but they can't. And the reason they can't is because prosecutors of the Southern District of New York and Homeland Security agents aren't going to let them. Right. Right. But they're not going to do it anyway. I mean, yeah, I would bet, anybody who wants to bet, <laughs> that within six months, there will be an article, probably front page, lower right, New York Times, Tom Mashberg, will say <laughs> the Met has, if you'd like to call it this, capitulated, and come to some resolution. My disappointment, which I learned tonight and believe tonight, is that they are not in a dialogue now. Bradley, did I understand that correctly? That's correct. Um, that surprises me, because that has to happen. And when it happens, I think some interesting things could come out of it, one of which will be the Met taking a bit more leadership in setting standards for how to behave under these circumstances. The other, hopefully, would be a kind of bilateral relationship with Cambodia on long-term loans and scholarly projects and endowed positions and conservation issues. I mean, the sky is blue if you'll just wake up.
That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that because the investigation is so vast and so many people are, are working on it and helping us, um, you know, the, the, you know I, I'd say to the Cambodians, one to two years from now, you might find the Metropolitan being one of your best friends. And they could change things tomorrow. They could change the entire situation tomorrow by coming clean, showing us all the provenance they, documents they have, letting the Cambodians choose what they want to have come home, including including ones that are not, you know, specifically tied to Latchford and so on. You know, they have dirty. You know, they have unclean hands. They they were very much mixed up with Latchford and the looting of an entire nation. And I think the podcast does justice to get out the story. Um, I've been remiss and uh, haven't opened the floor to questions with only four minutes left to go. So let's be quick and rapid fire question session. Just identify yourself very quickly. Uh, my name is David Van Bima. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about this panel is that everybody seems to be in total agreement with one another, which is, I think, rare on panels. Um, uh, and I found it a little confusing. Um, the, so I was kind of wondering what might members of the panel disagree about. And the only thing that I could really find was um, Gary seemed to suggest that a curator or somebody who ran a museum might wonder what would happen beyond the 44, beyond the 44 objects right. uh, that are obvious. Uh, whereas Bradley seemed to be suggesting that it was not merely the 44 objects, but many objects beyond that um, that should be dealt with. That seemed like a possible area where there might be some disagreement. Yes. And I was wondering if you that, could go into that. That is correct. The other area where I disagree with this guy is, I think the world right now is very different from the world I entered as a curator in the 80s. Um, and it's going the right direction. We need to get past this to get to a point where there is fluid exchange of objects for education and aesthetic purposes across borders. I lived in Romania under Ceausescu for a year. And nothing, books and people, ideas, nothing could move across a border. And for me, at least, objects, cultural object moving across borders is like people, ideas, and books. So we need to come to a place where it's respectful and accepted by both parties. That ownership is not the point. Museums not to, should get out of the ownership business and into the experience business. And that's where the Utah thing is yeah, promising. very interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I think that we should be agree and find a way to collaborate and ease out these situations that it shouldn't be a, a, a war. I don't need another war, okay? I got enough. And uh, so I need, I need all of us to work together, find a solution, and that we respect one another. If you don't want people to steal your ancestors' belonging, that's happened to me. They don't steal my ancestors' belonging, okay? What we need, what, what Cambodia needs, and what any country in the world need, we have to come to that same respect. And um, so, yes, thank you for agreeing, or, or if you say that we seem to share um, our, our opinion. I, I appreciate that, because to get this done, we have to. Um, come to that agreement. Yeah, I, I think it's very hard to take the other side of this argument. Or, uh, <laughs> we tried. We tried to invite we did people from the Gary, Gary was supposed to be the disputation. I, I, no, I told you I wasn't going to do that. Uh, I don't think. I don't think the Met would would defend their position if their position is actually a position and not actually a de, de facto transition. And I think that's what it is. But and that's why something's going to happen fairly soon, I think. You, you can definitely can I, make Can I just cut in just, just to make just, just one more you know, really powerful comment? I, I saw what happened yesterday with Sophaline when she went to the Met. She is a national hero of Cambodia. She, she is one of the most distinguished artists of Cambodia. She went and she did a ritual before a statue. She didn't damage anything. 
She just did what Cambodians would expect Cambodian people to do to respect their statue. And the Metropolitan Museum asked her to leave. They asked her to get out of the museum. They owe her an apology. And we would like to see that happen as part of this discussion of them returning stolen antiquities, anything that's, that's agreed to stay on loan, they make it clear that it's under ownership. And let's move forward in terms of collaboration and really creating a much more positive relationship and an honest one about, about the past and about the looting. That is a wonderful note on which to finish this panel. Um, I haven't left time for questions, but however, there is wine and canapes <coughs> afterwards outside, and we can continue the discussion. I think we're, no one's running off. And uh, yeah, if you want to come talk to us, do so. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our distinguished panel for thank you. taking the time. It's <laughs>